Hi everyone, uh, Steve again, um, back in the workshop. It's the end of uh, first week since um, we've come back from Norfolk and um, I've been in the workshop quite a lot this week uh, because I've been building uh, this. I'll just try and show you this. This is the... See that? Um, this is the, uh, the end of the, 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 new, the new gaff which is stretched out down that way on, on, on the workbench. And um, this is one of the ideas uh, I came back from Norfolk with because we did uh, quite a bit of walking around you know, the, the creeks. So, so Blakeney, um, Morston, Stiffkey and uh, Brancaster. There's quite a few uh, traditional boats uh, in the creeks there. I think quite a few of them are made by a local boat builder up there called uh, Charlie Ward. And they seem to be based on traditional Norfolk working boats. So they're often double enders with a hull, a GRP hull that's based on a, a clinker, a uh, wood, wooden hull. Uh, many, many of them are gaff rigged or, or lug rigged. And um, what I noticed on many of the Charlie Ward boats is this particular shape of a, a, a curved, curved gaff cheek. So I thought, oh, this, this will be maybe the way to do mine. So um, I spent several days just, just building this. Uh, this morning, um, for example, I, was, I did my morning exercise. I'm doing that every day now. And then, then about an hour ago, uh, I was sat, sat at the computer and doing some writing for the blog and doing my next blog piece. And um, one, of, one of my other browsers was open, so my, my, my email browser was open and it said, oh, your parcel has been delivered. In fact, there's two parcels have been delivered. Um, my, my sale is back, so that's actually sitting in its bag at the moment and it's it's too wet outside to do anything with it today. But um, this little beastie arrived. I'd get that out. That's a that's a uh, two inch roundover cutter for my big industrial router. And I've literally just been using that and my, my big router. Ugh, it's a beast. Very, very powerful machine. It's it's the one it's the one tool that I've got. That I'm intimidated by in the workshop. It's so powerful, and at the moment I'm sitting amongst uh, a huge pile of wood waste, and all the chippings and all the, the shavings off the router. The whole workshop is covered in it. So I'm going to take a break in a few minutes, and all I'm going to do for the next hour is clean the workshop. Anyway, um, yeah, we're back, and uh, this is an important week um, because what I'm hoping to do is get the sail out, uh, laid out on the on, on the floor outside when, it, when it's not raining and um, I need to obviously the most important thing is I need to test it against the length of the gaff because it's a, a recut of the head and if this doesn't fit <laughs> I've got a real problem because I'll have to make a new one well this is a new one so it'll be version 3 but I think this should be uh, an over length version of what I'm hoping that the, 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 the sale maker has done so I'm going to stop <laughs> even when I just started uh, show you the state of the workshop, have a cup of coffee, pack up tools, do about an hour of hoovering and then by then I hope the rain has stopped and I might be able to lay out a, a, a tarp outside on the, on the driveway and unpack the sail and see whether they actually match. Kind of hoping they do uh, this time. If they do then um, I'm going to get on in the next few days and hopefully get the, get, get the rig up again and this time uh, fill the hole, you know, put, put, put the sails on and start to work out all the sail handling arrangements because that's the next bit of thing I've got to do. So, um, stage one, catch, catch, catch you in a few minutes and show you what's going on. Day two. Sorry, sorry if I sound a bit tired. I just feel tired and groggy this morning. I don't know why. A couple of nights of bad sleep, maybe. But anyway, um, yeah, make or break day. Um, on my on my porch this morning, there's a bag with Elmaker's name on it, which I presume is my mainsail. I hope it is. 
So we're going to get that out and I've pulled the boat out already this morning and I'm going to lay out the cover tarp as a floor tarp to lay the sail out on and see whether this matches the gaff. If they do then fine we can proceed. If not then I'm going to do an awful lot of swearing and have a complete rethink about what I'm doing with this project. So anyway let's get his own bags and let's get on with the job. Hey? <coughs> Right then, um, day five, I think. Um, so there's good news and there's bad news. Um, do the good news first. I think it's much more important to put out a, a positive kind of video about what I did achieve and then explain uh, why I didn't achieve the whole job in one day and some of what the problems are. And uh, I haven't solved all the problems yet, but as I said, good news and bad news. So. It did stop raining and I had to mop the boat out, so that's the first. It's the first time the boat's ever been wet and it seemed to cope with it. And at the end of the day, you know, I did a very long working day, and I ended up with the, the sail filling the hole. That was the whole idea. So that's the good news, is that the sail mostly fits in terms of you know its gross shape, but it doesn't fit in any of the details, and that's what I'll um, probably do in a second video to explain what all the, the current problems are and because that's that second video will need quite a bit of time uh, explaining uh, each side of a four corner sail and, what, and, and what's wrong there and um, my solutions and I think the talking about the solutions will be a, a lot more interesting than that so um, I think I'll do that for today just show you what we did today um, what did we do so once the boat was out, uh, you've already seen that, hoisted the rig again, and that's now a fairly commonplace thing to do here. Uh, it goes up in a few minutes, except that um, it did seem to troll me a bit, in that I made quite a few mistakes doing that. hope I don't do that on the water. And then um, put the sail on the boat and attached it to the yard and put the yard on the, on the mast. I uh, had to take it off again because it didn't quite slide up and down the mast easily, but that was a, a 10 minute fix. So second, third and fourth tries, uh, actually attached it to the yard and hoisted it. And this is the result, um, hopefully here, that, that I had at the end of the day, which is the sail, as I said, broadly fits, but with um, lots of problems. So um, that's the job at this stage. And I thought what I'd like to do at the end of this video because I've always said I'd like to do this, is this is kind of, you know, on the bench with with the, uh, the, the gaff down again. And I'd like to go on to do a bit of Wabi chat, which is what I've also been doing this this, this week or the last, last couple of weeks since I last put out a video. And in this week's uh, Wabi chat section, what I want to do is a little bit of a chat about a particular piece of um, sailing uh, literature which is now nearly 100 years old so um, pretty special stuff and really interesting so that's yeah, that's what we'll do uh, so uh, a little, little bit of wabi chat about uh, yachting literature um, while I was away I had a fascinating contact and a few, co few online conversations with a lady called uh, Joanna who contacted me to ask me if I knew any of the the history and the, t the timeline with a very famous boat called uh, Juanita or Juanita, and uh, I did because going back about four or five years, uh, I briefly saw Juanita at the Orwell Sailing Club, and where she had been recently bought at that time by the same guy that I bought Inanda 
off and it now was the little Deben four tonner that I bought as a little you know classic boat kind of restoration rebuild and, and sail project. That project didn't work um, because what I found was while Inanda was perfectly capable in the East Coast rivers I and mean, she was you know, excellent in the Thames estuary but as soon as I got out into the channel you know those, those channel waves she just bang stopped bang stopped and had to keep you know bearing away and bearing away and bearing away to get speed up and she really did not like the English Channel whatsoever, so I sold her and, uh, and moved on. And anyway, um, Pete, the owner, um, what had he done? He had he had completely rebuilt and restored a, an, an Essex Smack, which is the boat he sails. But he had bought um, Juanita for his two grown-up children to sail and do some work on and um, restore. So anyway, anyway, moving, moving on the story. This lady called Joanna. Um, asked me, hey, you know, what did I know about the timeline of uh, Juanita? Because she was trying to trace that for a piece she's writing about Falmouth Key punts, so you know, class, class of boat. And I said, hey, look, you know, I, I know the guy who bought her, and she, but she already knew that. And what we were trying to do was, between us, make some of the connections between uh, Juanita as she is now and as I actually saw her many, many years ago. Um, on a trailer in in behind um, a, a sailmaker in Devon, and, I, and, I, and I, I hope Joanna has managed to to tie up a few strings. And anyway, in the, the in the meantime, the uh, the connection between the the two of us and um, Juanita is that she was once owned by someone that most people listening will probably never heard of, and uh, a lady lady by the name of. Uh, Dulcie Kennard, who wrote under a nom de plume uh, Peter Gerard, but might be better known as either Mrs. Griffiths the first because she was Maurice Griffiths' first wife, and later married to Charles Pierce, who was a, a marine artist. Anyway, um, I I found out initially about um, Dulcie Kennard of Peter Gerard through uh, Maurice Griffiths' own book, you know, the um, Man Magical Swatchways. It's, he, you know, she's mentioned there. And then again in um, this book, which is by uh, Mike Bender, and it's it's a, a new history of yachting. Now, I wrote, I, I read this uh, a couple of years ago, and it's quite an academic book about the history, of, uh, as it says, the history of yachting. Um, I do think that this book is very, is very, very good, but he, you can see in him the kind of left-wing socialist academic who wants to. Sp- talk in terms of class and I don't think it always pays off with yachting but you know it's, it's, it's his take and what, something that he says is you need to understand yachting in the, the context of the, the background era of the time that you know particular things are happening and um, it's really that's really relevant I think when it comes to um, Dulcie Kennard, Maurice Griffiths, Peter Gerard, whatever because what I found out is is that the world's first ever yachting uh, writer and perhaps also first solo boat owner is this lady called Dulcie Kennard or, or Peter Gerard and she wrote for the yachting press under this nom de plume called um, Peter Gerard and I knew she'd written a book or I found out that she had actually written you know her, her own um, autobiography so I very quickly ordered it and uh, you know here it, here it is <laughs> except it isn't because this is the same title which is Who Hath Desired to See which is a um, from a poem by Rudyard Kipling, and it's, this is an awfully dull, horrible book by Percy Chubb, I think. Anyway, um, so anyway, I asked Joanna if she knew of any copies, and she pointed me at either uh, a second-hand bookseller or Amazon, and I, I, and I actually managed to guess it, and, it, and here it is. And this is the book called um, "Who Hath Who Hath Desired to See," and this is by. Um, Peter Gerard or Dorset Kennard or Mrs. Piers, um, uh, Mrs. Griffiths the first, and it's a really interesting book. So this book, um, this book is now um, must be 100 years old. It must, it must have been written in the, 19, in the 1920s. And the thing I found really fascinating about this is that she is genuinely the first ever female yachting writer. And something I wondered, and that was from from, from reading um, Mike, Mike Mike Bender's work is what perspective 
she would have that would maybe be very different from the predominantly male writers of the time. I mean, when you consider this is the era that Maurice Griffiths was writing about, and he refers back to you know even older or uh, earlier writers, where you can see that the writing is almost kind of rigidly conservative. And I wondered at the time, I asked the question of, you know, what would a woman, how would, how would, you know, a woman write at the time? And of course, um, Dulcie Kennard. Uh, in 1920 was only in her 20s and she's a really really interesting character in that she was um, brought up I think in South Africa but I, I've seen also uh, the Far East mentioned and she was brought up in a military family father I think survived the First World War but then they came back to England and she had this kind of strange and sudden desire to own a boat um, and not, not, not as second string to any old bloke although you know, she discovered uh, Morris Griffiths, whom she calls Bongo, um, but that she really wanted to own a boat herself. And a, lo a lot of this story is about uh, her ownership of Juanita, which she sailed for quite a while as the first ever sailing school stroke academy, mainly for women. And she, she, she took on you know, um, women trainees as cadets and had quite a few kind of really interesting voyages just doing that. And then she also, um, again, sailed with a new husband, um, um, Charles Piers. And anyway, here's the book. It's a very, 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 very good story. And I do think it has a very different perspective to even um, the writer whom I thought was a really excellent writer, and that's Maurice Griffiths. And this is like, the, they're almost like mirrors of each other, of uh, both, both talking about similar voyages with, um, you know his perspective and her perspective and it's it's been a really interesting thing to to read and i'm i'm about three quarters of the way through so that's what i'm working on anyway um for, for this piece um i just wanted to mention that and if you're into your signature this might be a really interesting book to try and find a copy of and read purely because it's such a different take on yachting in 1920 which is an era which is it's almost impossible for us to understand, I think, unless you also see it in the context of what it would have been like in 1924, uh, a young woman. Because remember, this is only just after the, the First World War, when you know, many of the menfolk have been killed, slaughtered in the First World War. And the expectations of women are still very, very rigid and very, very conservative. And in a way, her, her escape to the sea is kind of like um, Morris Griffith's own escape to the sea in that he wanted to escape the life which he had had to create to get by once his family lost all its money. So yeah, um, end, of, <laughs> end, end of a long story um, by this book. Who Hath Desired the Sea by, um, by Peter Gerard. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching the story about the sale. I'm going to continue us in part two when I'm going to explain the technical problems and I hope show you all of the technical solutions which I've found to actually making the sales work. And um, I know this is going on a bit, but it just seems a lot more work than I expected. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. See you on bye.